Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our joint RAL M Cube distinguished speaker, Professor Kerry Emanuel. And I, first of all, I want to thank M Cube for their support of this seminar and for the refreshments they provided. So I asked Kerry how he likes to be introduced, and he said, ones that are brief. So I'm going to try to oblige. Um, Professor Emanuel is visiting us today related to a joint NCAR MIT project that. Um, is developing new frameworks for predicting rapid intensification for tropical cyclones. His graduate student, Jonathan Lin, has been visiting uh, this summer through the Graduate Visitor Program of the Advanced Study Program. And Jonathan's been develop developing and implementing a framework for probabilistic point-wise prediction of tropical cyclone winds. Um, Kerry's well known for his work on hurricanes and climate, as well as his work on tropical thermodynamics and convection. And so today he's going to speak to us on something that's more related to those latter topics. His seminar is entitled Slow Modes of the Equatorial Waveguide. Thank you, John. <clears throat> About that title, you know, I read it this morning and I said, that reminds me of something, just the way it flows, like creatures from the outer tar sands. <laughs> I better change it. <laughs> I didn't get around to changing it. Anyway, thank you for the introduction. Um, what I want to do today is to talk a little bit. I'm going to actually um, abuse my privilege as speaker and kind of wing it and talk about what I think I've learned over the last 40 years or so of trying to understand how convection and large scale flows interact and try to say something a little bit provocative to you about that, to some of you anyway, and then talk a little bit about observations of the very interesting um, variability in the equatorial waveguide that we see mostly from analyzing observations from space. Uh, and then do something which looks like an abrupt switch of topics, but isn't really, which is to talk about the interesting, fairly recently discovered phenomenon of the self-aggregation of convection and, and how it will end up bearing on <clears throat> these first two points. A look at cloud permitting simulations, very recently possible of the whole equatorial waveguide, and then talk about trying to understand what we're seeing through the lens of uh, simple linear theory. So let me begin at the beginning with a discussion of that. Uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, there was a lot of excitement early on about the whole problem of tropical convection and how it interacted with larger scales. This is the era of CISC. Um, I uh, went from my graduate program to UCLA, and UCLA was very active in this arena. Mikio Yanai and his colleagues were uh, doing some very clever analyses of tropical radioson data and understanding things like heating profiles of convection. But there was a, um, a way of thinking about convection back then that persisted today, which I've been trying to yank people away from with essentially zero success, all right? It's not going to stop me trying to do it again today, and that is the tendency to regard latent heating in cumulus clouds the same way we think about an external heat source, like we put a blowtorch in a fluid, okay? It isn't the same. It's, it's fundamentally different because it's an internal energy conversion and it should not be thought of as an external source. And a lot of what I think tropical meteorology, including especially me, got wrong over this period of 40 years was trying to think about latent heating as an external heat source. Let me just give you one example where you can clearly go wrong. If you literally have an external heat source, like a fire or a light bulb or something, it's almost guaranteed you're going to get a circulation. And among other things, you're going to see a strong positive correlation between the heating and the temperature, which, of course, you need to get energy conversions, kinetic energy. In an internal conversion, latent heating, because you're close to thermodynamic uh, equilibrium, that need not be the case. And in fact, in reality, it's often negative. You have a lot of latent heating in cold air, and you're actually sapping kinetic energy from the system. In the case of convection, we have a name for that. We call that moist convective damping, all right? That's just one kind of small illustration of how you can go wrong by persistent thinking of latent heating as a heat source for circulation. So I'm going to maintain with you that the evidence we have to date shows that um, it's very hard to identify a tropical circulation bigger than a squall line. 
obviously bigger than a cumulus cloud, bigger than a squall line, that's not really driven by something that's truly external to the system, like radiation or surface fluxes that affect the whole column entropy content and not, it's not just a rearrangement of enthalpy in the column, all right? So that's what I want you to think about. If there's one thing I want you to take away, and if history is any guide, very few of you will, not because you're not smart, but because you'll push back at me, right? Is that um, we should stop thinking about latent heating as a source for anything larger than, say, a squall line. You know, for cumulus clouds, thunderstorms, squall lines, fine. Uh, conditionally unstable atmospheres. I'm going to argue the tropics is not a conditionally unstable atmosphere, not at all. And some of you have heard me argue that before. Well, let's start off with some observations. So we're on the same page. And I'm going to be focusing on the equatorial region. This is just the mean and the standard deviation of monthly anomalies of satellite measured OLR between 1979 and 1995. Naturally, where you see low OLR, it's mostly because of high clouds. And so you see high clouds over the maritime continent, the intertropical conversion zone in the Pacific and the Atlantic, and strongly over tropical continents. And one thing you want you to notice is the tendency for the OLR peaks to be continental in the tropics, okay? Of course, there are OLR peaks over the ocean too, but a lot over the continents. But on the other hand, if you look at trim measured precipitation, um, there's not such a heavy weighting toward the continents. So you see lots of uh, precipitation over the ocean, obviously, and over land. You don't see the dominance. So there's something a little special about continents and their ability to produce the kinds of clouds that tend to block outgoing radiation. That's kind of interesting. But you have this broad distribution of precipitation. What's interesting is if you start looking at the sub-seasonal variation of the OLR, you begin to see patterns. And I'm going to refer heavily to the work that was done by George Kaladis and Matt Wheeler, and some of you, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but let's just review that. They looked at, what they did is they began by doing a wave number frequency analysis of OLR in a narrow belt centered on the equator, but through the whole range of longitudes. And uh, this is what you see. So the convention here is this is zonal wave number with zero in the center. This is frequency in cycles per day. Negative, the frequencies are assumed to be, or defined to be positive definite, but negative wave numbers denote westward propagation of the waves. <coughs> and um, so you see a very, very uh, red spectrum, both in frequency and wave number, which is itself an interesting uh, Observation, why is the spectrum so red? Well, almost everything we see in the atmosphere in terms of turbulence is red, but we're now talking about very large scales here. But you'll notice that, and they notice, that there, uh, you know, if it was a simple spectrum, you might think of these contours as being broadly semicircular in a space like this, but they're departures from that. So what they did was to begin by smoothing that spectrum, just literally smoothing the power spectrum, OLR, to get something like that. And then looking at the difference between the smooth spectra and the actual spectra. And um, if you look at just the symmetric part of the variability, you divide it into, into uh, equatorially symmetric and anti-symmetric parts, which you can do. Um, this is a symmetric part, and what was remarkable, what they noticed right away, is that the variance, or the power, tends to line up with the linear dispersion curves derived in 1966 by Matsuno. We're just looking at the shallow water equations on an on a, uh, equatorial beta plane, um, linearized around a state of rest. You get this beautiful set of dispersion curves, and this set of curves pertains to equatorial Kelvin waves. These are just buoyancy waves that are trapped by the variation of the Coriolis parameter to be on the equator and, and to necessarily propagate eastward on our, uh, as a function of the rotation direction of our planet. And um, these are equatorial Rossby waves, which specifically propagate westward. And you can see some tendency for variance in this realm. 
And um, then up here, you have a whole sort of discrete spectrum of internal waves that are internally trapped. And there's some hint of some variance up there. If you look at the anti-symmetric part, this is just repeating what I said, westward inertia gravity waves, equatorial velocity waves. This is the anti-symmetric part of the spectrum. And you had another uh, class of waves. These are the um, mixed Rossby gravity waves. At low frequency, they tend to look like Rossby waves and behave like them. At high frequency, they behave more like internal waves. And there's a big maximum in the spectrum there. And to go back for a minute well, to the previous diagram, on the other hand, the symmetric part, there's a lot of variance down here at very low frequency in the eastward propagating domain that does not line up with any of the classical Matsuno dispersion curves. And that, of course, is the MJO, the Madden-Julian oscillation, which was discovered by people working right here at NCAR, and has been a great puzzle, and, and arguably remains one for the whole field. And I'm going to try to tackle that, like a lot of other people uh, have before me today. What's that? Um, it doesn't seem to line up with any of these curves. So the MJO variance doesn't line up with the Matsuno dispersion curve. But we can ask, using these observations, there's something interesting going on, because these are very large scale, low frequency oscillations. And one thing I should mention about them is that although they line up with the dispersion curves, if you were to look at the atmosphere with its observed stratification and just neglect condensation of water vapor and look at the linear modes of such an atmosphere, you would get modes like this, but much faster than observed. In other words, the slope of the observed um, variance is much lower than what you would get what you predict quantitatively by looking at a dry tropical atmosphere. So Madden and Julian and Wheeler and Kaledis and everyone has followed has recognized that fundamentally these ways, particularly the Kelvin ways, have to be convectively coupled. You really can't explain their phase speed by just waves in a dry atmosphere that don't care about the fact that there's convection. All right. But how does that happen? And that has presented a great interesting theoretical uh, challenge, all of which will ultimately bear on the problem of tropical forecasting. But today we're going to stick to just trying to understand what, what's going on here. So I'm going to operate on this uh, hypothesis. Um, and that is that the organization, I'll call it the self-organization, which is to say it's, it's not something that we're imposing externally. Self-organization of convection on scales larger than squall lines requires either modulation of radiative cooling rates or surface fluxes, or both. And that without those two things, that it doesn't happen. All right. So another way of putting it is that the interaction between large scale circulations and convection per se doesn't produce energy in the tropical atmosphere. All right. And I'm going to argue there's very good reason to believe it shouldn't. All right any more than you'd expect waves tra uh, traveling through a dry convective fluid that are much larger than the scale of the convecting elements to uh, derive energy directly from the convection. So that's the hypothesis. If you don't like it, I have others. But this is my favorite one. <laughs> um, and so I want you to contemplate that. So latent heating is important, but it is not the source. I'm arguing it's not the source of the wave energy. Okay? So I want you to push back on it if you have a good argument. But from what I've seen, I, I'm sticking to this until I'm proven wrong, or at least a pretty good evidence is presented that that's not right. Um, so, what is the energy sources for large scale circulations? If you look at classical studies of convection, the laboratory theoretical studies, you see that in regular convection, like Brayley Baynard convection, um, energy, convective energy, is released principally on um, small scales. That is, in the case of uh, Brayley Baynard convection, scales on the order of the depth of the fluid. Right? Or if you're thinking of the troposphere, scales on the lateral scales on the order of the depth of the troposphere, H. That's what we, it's one of the first things we learn 
But under some circumstances, and there's some very interesting evidence there, the kinetic energy that's generated by the small scale turbulence can cascade upward, or some of it can cascade upward into larger scales. That usually happens in rotating systems, but can happen in non-rotating systems. And I've given you an example, a recent example of a paper which shows this happening rather definitively. So yes, you can do it. I wouldn't describe that as the interaction of the large scale uh, um, circulations with small scale convection, but more as an upward cascade. Now, if you look on the other hand of the energy budget of numerically simulated large scale tropical systems, even tropical cyclones, show no evidence of a, an important upscale cascade in Earth-like conditions. I can show you examples of simulations of convecting planetary atmospheres where this does happen. But evidently in the Earth-like regime, uh, it's much more a case of the available energy, uh, available potential energy being generated itself at large scales and then converted into kinetic energy. Now, the, that particular conversion is very strongly affected by small scale convection, but it's not an upscale cascade. Okay, not in the di not in the systems that I'm aware of that have been diagnosed in the literature you know, that, that do the, the classical sort of Lorenzian energy budget. So now let's turn to something that it seems like a different problem altogether from equatorial convection, but I don't think it is, which is the phenomenon that uh, was discovered, I would say, in cloud permitting numerical simulations, which is the self aggregation of moist convection. This has a long history. Um, it goes back, I would say, to uh, possibly to a paper by Isaac Held, but that was in 2D, and 2D energy cascades are very different. But there was this paper by Adrian Tompkins and George Craig in 1998, which was doing radiative convective equilibrium, pardon my acronym, that's RCE, in a 3D box. And they concluded by analyzing that. So basically, I'll show you how that's set up. You just, you just do a convection in a doubly periodic box uh, with very ho homogeneous boundary conditions. So it's supposed to be mimicking an infinite plane, not rotating. Uh, and they noticed by doing uh, mechanism denial experiments that the organization seemed to result from the interactions between radiation and convection and surface fluxes. Okay, and this is a, a theme I will argue they got it right. And almost every successive study that's been done of this phenomenon has uh, shown that this is true. For example, the paper by which I recommend to you by Bretherton, Blossy, and Karatnadoff in 2005, they concluded that the self-aggregation is analyzed as an instability of horizontally homogeneous convecting atmosphere driven by convection, water vapor, and radiation feedback that systematically dry the drier air columns and moisten the moist ones. And they concluded that they showed that the self-aggregation can be suppressed by homogenizing, horizontally homogenizing, the radiative cooling and the surface fluxes. So what am I talking about here? Well, we're going to look at these uh, simulations in these um, doubly periodic boxes. So here's one. This is from a paper that was uh, done by my student, Allison Wing, some years ago. You have a fixed constant SST. doesn't vary in space or time. Um, the boxes are typically a order of 1,000 kilometers uh, square, although recent times have gotten bigger than that. <clears throat> and different geometries, 28 kilometers high, so going up into the stratosphere, ultimately a rigid lid at the top. You have a constant stream of solar insulation coming in, but you have full radiative transfer physics in the code. Um, the horizontal resolutions are typically in the order of a kilometer or so. Uh, so they permit convection, but by no means do they resolve it. Um, 64 levels in the vertical and so forth. The initial sounding comes from something you see in the tropics, but it doesn't really matter for what I'm going to show you, because we're interested in the statistical equilibrium state. And you reach the same statistical equilibrium with some interesting exceptions, to, independent of what you're starting from. So, oops. So this is what you see. So. Here's a doubly periodic box. This one's 1,500 kilometers, but I'm showing you 500 by 1,500 kilometers. 
column water vapor, this is snapshot in time, column water vapor precipitation, OLR, and you see what you sort of expected to see and what I saw when I first did 3D cloud resolving simulations in the uh, mid 90s, um, just random convection. Right? It's sort of what you expect to see. It's like watching boiling water. It's not very different from that if I were to show you a movie, which I'm not brave enough to do because they never work on my machines. But um, the surprise came if you, this sort of bubbles along for a while. And if the conditions are right, if the parameters of the simulation are right, you get a really, really spectacular phase change in the whole system. And it goes to basically a single blob of water vapor, very dry outside of it. All the precipitation is in this blob. It doesn't have to be in the center of the domain because it's doubly periodic. It just happens to be in this simulation. Um, this is the OLR. So, so this is spontaneous aggregation into a cluster. And this cluster is on a scale which is still big compared to individual convective cells, which you can see here and here. Um, and we don't know what determines the scale of that cluster at this point in the history of science. If uh, you double the domain, and I showed you that and didn't show you the scale was different, you wouldn't see anything terribly different. In other words, the cluster just doubles in size too. So at least in these simulations, the cluster size is being artificially determined by the domain size. Maybe if we got up to really big scales, we'll discover how this thing really does scale. But it happens, and when it, uh, when uh, I know when Chris Bretherton first did this, he thought it had, it had to be something numerical. He didn't necessarily think it was real. But lots of different groups have reproduced results like these with different models. So it's real in models. Is it real in nature? Well, we've known they're cloud clusters for a long time, like this beautiful picture from uh, one of the space shuttle flights in July of 1985. This one is over the river uh, delta region between uh, India and Bangladesh. And you can see the individual convective cells, so lots of them there, but there's this cluster. And you can also see that the ring, there's a ring around the uh, cluster where it's unusually devoid of deep convection. The background, you see this sort of dog's dinner of convection is more like we envision radiative convective equilibrium normally to look like in the tropics. Not that this is necessarily RCE. Um, I think a lot of people, at least I always thought these had to be externally forced, that something was coming along, some synoptic scale system that triggered this and organized the convection. But now we're confronted with the possibility that this happens spontaneously. I don't know that this is an example of that, but it could be. Now, when you put this whole system on an F-plane, uh, what you get are tropical cyclones. Now, you can see in this case, we have more than one in the domain, so we've been able to understand in this case, with that additional constraint, one more parameter, a Coriolis parameter, we do have well-defined length and time and velocity scales uh, that emerge from these simulations in which the scaling works very well across a very large range of conditions. So we sort of understand this from a scaling point of view, whereas we don't understand the non-rotating case yet from a scaling point of view, okay? Now, um, these actually emerge spontaneously even more readily than in the uh, non-rotating simulations. I want to make it aside here. Um, tropical meteorology is full of lore. It's something I realized when I came in. There, uh, there are things that statements that people make all over, over and over again. If you try to trace them back in the literature, you can't find an objective basis for that, really. One of them is that tropical cyclones always are force initially. That is, and I said, said this myself many times. They always emerge from some pre-existing disturbance. In other words, they need to be triggered. Clearly, that has to be revisited. That may not be true. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ar argue that, and I'm not the first to do so, that the MJO is quite likely what happens when the, when the physics of the self-organization uh, are put on a rotating sphere. By the way, what are those physics? This is a very, very interesting story. I think we understand the physics pretty well. Um, several things happen when convection begins to cluster. The air 
in the immediate vicinity of the convection is moister than it normally is at the, those middle altitudes. And you have more high clouds and less OLR. And so you're trapping infrared radiation. And so you're producing a heating anomaly, which is in phase with the positive moist static energy anomaly you already have there. Uh, secondarily, uh, you have more gust fronts, if you will, of convection at the surface. You have more gustiness. And at fixed ocean temperature, that gives you more flux. And that's working in the same direction. Uh, in the case of tropical cyclones, that tends to dominate very quickly. But in the non-rotating case, it's the radiation usually that's the dominant driving force. So it's a feedback between radiation and um, this cluster scale circulation. Very strongly modulated by convection, but not forced by convection. If you homogenize the radiative cooling, there is no clustering. If you homogenize the radiative cooling, when you already have a cluster, the cluster goes away. Um, uh, and if you, <coughs> if you um, homogenize the radiative cooling and the surface fluxes, nothing ever happens. You're dead in the water, and all you have is popcorn convection. Convection is driven by latent heat release, but not these larger scale circulations. Yes, they're greatly affected by the fact there's convection. They wouldn't exist without it, but it's not the latent heat release. It's the cloud radiation interaction in the surface fluxes. And you can see that uh, self-organization on a sphere. This is some work by uh, Nathan Arnold and David Randall <clears throat> from a few years ago. And this is non-rotating spheres. It's just putting the whole problem in spherical geometry. And they're using the super parameterized CAN in this case. And this is just different days, 10, 15, 20 days. Well, I guess at the end is 120 days. And by 120 days, the convection's all aggregated in these big lumps. They're sort of quasi-global scale lumps in this case. Um, if you look at this set at the top, this is kind of what I just showed you, 27 degrees C, fixed ocean temperature everywhere. So it's just global RCE. No variations of radiation uh, due to latitude. If you homogenize the long wave radiation, it goes away pretty much. And um, if you uh, homogenize the surface fluxes, on the other hand, in this case, you still do get clustering because you've got the radiation modulation going on. This is what happens if you use the non-superparameterized CAM, at least this version of CAM. What we're go doing from left to right is varying the entrainment parameter in the convection scheme. So it has ordinary convection parameterization. And um, so for, for the sort of standard values that are actually used, you don't get self-aggregation. But if you really pump up the entrainment, you do, although it's a little bit different in character. And uh, at least I'm told that when you make the entrainment parameter that large, other aspects of the climate begin to look a little less like reality. So modelers do this with some reluctance. So we're going to go back to the SP cam and make another point. This is just uh, experiments with different fixed surface temperature. This is the control. If you make it colder, you still get aggregation, but it's weaker. And if you make it hotter, it gets stronger. And we've seen that in box simulations at all. Then this, I think, will turn out to have a very profound effect on how we understand climate and climate sensitivity. Because when the convection aggregates, there is a net increase in OLR. You're drying out, and the net, you're drying out the atmosphere, even though the clusters are moist the average OLR goes up. So you're cooling the system. But as you can see here, when you cool the system, you lose the aggregation. It wants to re-moisten. So it, it's attracted to some intermediate state. In box models, it's, it's, uh, it's a very well-defined state because there's a critical SST below it, which it won't aggregate at all, and above which it does. It's like a step function. And the system is attracted to that particular critical temperature. So it's a self-organized critical system. And a sphere, it's less obviously so. Now we'll get to closer to the theme of the talk, which is the equator. So here's a simulation I did with Murat Karatnadov in a, well, I think it's probably stretching things to call it a cloud permitting model because it's 20 kilometers resolution. It's all we could afford at the time. We've done better since then. And it's only going up to 46 degrees latitude in both hemispheres. 
But otherwise, it's the same. It's an aqua planet, uniform SST, in this case, 300 degrees. Uh, no variation of insulation with latitude. And the Coriolis parameter varies as it should with latitude. And you get all kinds of variability in this, including some tropical cyclones at higher latitudes. And if you look at a wave number frequency decomposition of this variability, it's, um, it has some of the features uh, that you see in the real world. It has the, <coughs> the sort of Kelvin wave spectrum. There is a big peak uh, that's very focused in wave number and frequency around wave number one maybe 30 or 40 to 50 days frequency, which we identify as an MGO, whose structure and behavior is somewhat distinct, as I'll show you from these guys. Don't see much by way of equatorial Rossby waves, though. And if you look at the, this is the equatorial symmetric part of the spectrum. This is the asymmetric. There's the uh, mixed Rossby or, Gra or Yanai wave spectrum there. So this model likes to produce that stuff. But of course, with the model, you can do sort of mechanism denial experiments. Before I do that, I'm going to show you a composite around this MJO mode. So we put a filter on to isolate the MJO mode at low frequency and wave number one, and, um, or just very low wave numbers. And we're going to composite around the OLR minimum, which is where this black dot is. So that's sort of what we're calling the center of the upward motion of the yeah, it may not be that, but it's the OLR minimum by definition. And here are the surface enthalpy fluxes. So we're looking at basically the contributions to a column integrated moist static energy tendencies. Remember that where you have this OLR minimum, you tend to have, you strongly tend to have a maximum in the column integrated moist static energy. It's a moist column. But the surface fluxes are in quadrature with this moist static energy driving the system eastward, OK? Uh, but the radiation, the net radiative heating anomaly at this frequency and wave number is pretty much centered on the OLR. This is another case where it's mostly being driven, we would argue, in, in the model, entirely driven by cloud radiation and maybe by water vapor radiation interactions. And um, here is uh, the advection, which is mostly a vertical advection to moist static energy. This is now in sort of statistical equilibrium. This is the main break on the system. It's countering the radiative heating. And this is just some, the sum of these terms. Um, remember, it's quasi-steady, so there's no tendency where the thing itself is a maximum. And you see the eastward propagation there. So if we look at the sort of Hoffmuller diagrams, so this is time. And this is uh, low frequency variability. And you can see in uh, OLR, you can see these eastward propagating disturbances. That's the MJO. This is the spectrum that's associated with that. But we're filtering out these high frequency waves when we do this diagram. This is an experiment where we homogenize the surface fluxes at each time step. So the surface fluxes are horizontally uniform. And we get an even stronger signal when we do that. Surface fluxes are a break on the MJO mode in this model. Uh, but they don't propagate. They're just stationary. They've lost their propagation. And you can see that, basically, because of the filtering, it disappears from the wave number frequency diagram. If you homogenize the radiation, you get eastward propagating modes of lower amplitude, but they're faster. And we're probably looking at some of the lower frequency part of the Kelvin wave spectrum here. If you homogenize everything, everything disappears. We don't have homogenize everything. You're homogenizing radiation and surface fluxes horizontally, everything disappears. Okay. And there are a lot of different simulations that have been done of RCE type states, statistical equilibrium states. Where if you do this, going back to Bretherton and Tompkins and Craig, if you do this, you lose the variability. Although, you still have some high frequency Kelvin waves. All right. And so why are those there? We don't have an answer to that question. One possibility is there are still, there are still things going on at higher latitudes in this model. Uh, we're not quite at the latitude that we have barrack clinic instability, but we have tropical cyclone-like disturbances. They're kind of weak. But we sort of theorize that maybe some of their energy leaks into this 
equatorial wave guide and shows up as Calvin waves, but we're not quite sure why that's there. They're much weaker than in the control simulation. So with that as a background, let's try to understand in more detail what's going on with the physics of these modes. And to do that, we're going to look at uh, linear uh, modes of the equatorial wave guide. And there's a critical assumption here, which I'll defend. Uh, and that is the tropical atmosphere has very nearly moist adiabatic lapse rates. It's not like Colorado in the summer, OK? It's a very different place. Um, if any of you want to play around with soundings like this, I can set you up to do this very easily, and I encourage you to do it. So this is just looking at, I'm showing you one example, but you can see many, many that exhibit similar properties. This is Majuro, a tropical island in the Western Pacific. And the red curve is the temperature sounding from a balloon. And the green is the dew point temperature. And then I have a bunch of hypothetical thermodynamic profiles here. The red dash line is taking air from near the surface and lifting it up pseudo adiabatically. And if you do that, you can see that there's some cape, uh, available energy in the sounding. But if you go to the opposite extreme and you lift up air reversibly from about 500 meters over the sea surface, that's the blue dots. And they go up pretty much along the sounding. And believe me, I've looked at thousands and thousands of soundings, and most of them are like this. For reasons I can't explain, they're almost perfectly neutral to a reversible ascent, not from the surface, but from around cloud base uh, in the tropics. Right? It is so systematic that it's spooky. It's too good to be a coincidence, but I can't explain it, because what is the relevance of a reversible adiabatic process in a real cloud? You can play around with entraining plumes. I've done that. You can get close, but not nearly as close as this. Anyway, empirically, we're going to say the atmosphere is moist adiabatic. Now, for the simple linear model, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to go into the nitty picky differences between pseudo adiabats and reversible adiabats. We'll just say that the saturation moist entropy is constant. And the saturation moist entropy, which I'm calling S star, is just a function of temperature and pressure. And of course, you have the specific humidity, but this is by definition the specific humidity at saturation, which is itself a function of temperature and pressure. And the statement that the lapse rate is moist adiabatic in a simple system like that is equivalent to the statement that S star is constant with height. That's all. So. Um, that's an assumption we're going to make for this little model. S star is constant. When you do that, you have a remarkable simplification of the hydrostatic equation. So if we start with a hydrostatic equation and pressure coordinates, this is geopotential, this is specific volume, and we're perturbing it around a resting state. We're looking at the linear functions there. And the uh, density or specific volume perturbation can be expressed through one of Maxwell's relations as a variation of the saturation entropy times something that's a moist adiabatic lapse rate. So if we put that, if we go backwards and substitute that into here, it turns out that because S star is constant, you can integrate that hydrostatic equation directly. All the way through the troposphere or whatever layer S star is constant, and you get this, the hydro, that the geopotential perturbation can be divided into a barotropic part that doesn't vary in height and a baroclinic part whose vertical structure, remember S star doesn't vary with height, but it can vary with time and horizontal distance, whose uh, structure depends on departures of the, temperature, of the mean temperature at a given level from the moist adiabat. Okay, so in other words, the constraint that the lapse, uh, atmosphere is both hydrostatic and moist adiabatic strongly constrains the vertical structure of linear pressure perturbations in the small amplitude pressure perturbations. It's a remarkable thing. It's our, you know, we can't do quasi-geostrophy in the tropics, but we can do this, okay? And what it does is, I'll show you in a minute, is it collapses the linearized primitive equations uh, because this is 
the vertical structure of this is constrained, and this is linear uh, in velocities. We've linearized it. It constrains similarly the vertical structure of the horizontal velocities. They have to have the same kind of decomposition. And that <coughs> vertical structure looks like this. So this is just um, the, the uh, moist adiabatic lapse rate. And this is just the vertical mean of that. And so the structure of the perturbations is the structure of the difference between this curve and that curve. So that's called the first bare clinic mode structure. If the velocity is from the east at low levels, it has to be from the west at high levels. Okay? If pressure perturbation is low at low levels, it has to be high at high levels. It, it collapses the primitive equations into the mathematical form of the shallow water equations, which is why the shallow water equations seem to work so well, I think, in the equatorial region, which Matsuno discovered. It also, through mass continuity and pressure coordinates, constrains the vertical profile of the vertical velocity or pressure velocity omega. I won't take you through all the math. If you, uh, and this is, it turns out to be a very bad assumption, but if you put a rigid lid at the tropopause, then there is a clear separation between the barotropic and the first baroclinic mode. The barotropic uh, is a simple vorticity equation, and, and it's completely decoupled in this linear system from the shallow water equations that describe the first barotropic mode. And here's the characteristic vertical profile of omega. You don't get to choose that. You don't get to choose a vertical profile of latent heating, which is a completely a response in the system. It's not a forcing. All right? it's, it's contained in the definition of what we're calling entropy. And in my mind, that's the only way to go for this scale of motion. All right? um, we handle the feedback of air motion on temperature in the system by looking at the vertically integrated equation for enthalpy. And in the absence of surface fluxes or radiation or strong horizontal advection, then you just have this vertical advection term. And Neelan and Held in a famous paper in 1987 asserted that this so-called um, effective uh, or gross moist stability is positive, which means this function is negative for upward motion. Upward motion tends to, to drop, the advectively drop the moist static energy or enthalpy of the column. Upward uh, motion tends to be associated with moistening, and therefore you can make the inference that ascent leads to cooling. Because if you have moistening, but the moist static energy is falling, the only option is for the uh, air to be um, cooling. And we represented, Yano and I represented that as an effective stratification of the troposphere as the dry stratification times one minus the precipitation efficiency of the convection. If convection is perfectly efficient, the effective stability is zero. The air only feels the moist about it, the moist stability, which is zero. And if there's no uh, convection, um, if epsilon is zero, no net latent heat release, then you're back to the dry stratification. So um, that's an interesting thing. So we basically assert the effective stratification is a function of precipitation efficiency. And this is yet another of many, many realms, don't get me started on this, where microphysics proves to be very important for what's going on dynamically. You cannot sweep the microphysics under the carpet. Now, this is a gross simplification, obviously, but you can't neglect it. Um, so the prediction is, and this goes back now decades, that in viscid small amplitude perturbations in the tropical atmosphere under a rigid lid collapse to the shallow water equations with a vastly reduced equivalent depth compared to what it would be if the atmosphere were dry. Now, in this model I'm about to show you, we do that. We use this sort of um, moist adiabatic linearized equations, which again, mathematically, are like the shallow water equations. But we do have to represent uh, convection, its effect on the temperature of the column and on the moisture. And we do that using something called boundary layer quasi-equilibrium, where we assume that the uh, convection is just strong enough to remove moist static energy from the boundary layer at the rate it's supplied by advection in surface fluxes. That also has a pretty long history. So if you will bear with me for a couple of slides, I have to show you what's in this model. So 
Here are the equations. These are the linearized equations on a beta plane. They've been normalized. All the, the uh, dependent and independent variables have been non-dimensionalized, and I won't take you through that here. This is the Coriolis terms, okay? This, this is a non-dimensional parameter. So what are all these things? So the dependent variables are the zonal wind, perturbation, the meridional wind. Of course, we have a vertical velocity. This is just mass continuity here. The, the temperature variable is the free troposphere perturbation saturation entropy. And I'll tell you what's on the right-hand side in a minute. And then we have the actual moist entropy, which is our moisture variability, kind of moisture variability in the system. Now, the, the hydrostatic and momentum equations are just the ordinary shallow water equations that you get from this reduction. The interesting stuff is what's been put into the right-hand side of the temperature and moisture equations. So let me explain that. Um, by linearizing the, the aerodynamic formula for surface fluxes, if you have an entropy perturbation, a temperature perturbation in the free troposphere, you have to have a, a corresponding entropy perturbation in the boundary layer to maintain moist neutrality. But by the aerodynamic for, formula, if you have that, you're going to have reduced fluxes. So this is a damping by surface fluxes. Um, and you have that actually in the uh, moist entropy equation as well. Then this is the artificial term. It's called, the, this is what we do for cloud radiation feedback. We simply assume that if the column is moisture, it will have more clouds. It's sort of the simplest assumption you can make. It's qualitatively right, uh, but it's a linear model, right? We're not writing, we're not writing wharf for the tropics here. Um, the wishy term assumes that the mean flow is easterly. So if you have perturbation easterly, that is negative U, you're going to have excess surface fluxes which affect both the temperature of the free troposphere through this convective uh, quasi-equilibrium hypothesis and directly the moist entropy. Um, there's surface flux damping also in the moisture equation from the, for the same reason. The gross moistability, which is assumed to be positive, so vertical velocity reduces the moist static energy or the moisture of the column. And then the, the really dubious term, it turns out not to matter that much, is what I call the wave radiation emulator. And I said a while back that the assumption of rigid lid is really bad. It really is bad. But to do it properly, which Yano and I did, mostly Yano did in the early 90s, is way beyond my algebraic talents. It's just really complicated. It's straightforward. It's really complicated. I'm too old for that. So I'm putting in an emulator of ray rate. What we know is that it, it, you, you lose energy faster at higher frequencies, which somewhat translate to higher zonal wave numbers. So that's a fake term in the end to handle that wave radiation. If everything depended on it, I wouldn't be giving you this talk. Um, now, let's look at the uh, integral constraints of the linear equations themselves. We'll define an averaging operator averaging over infinity in, in the meridional direction. This is a beta plane. And over the uh, circumference of the Earth in X, so that those brackets are the averaging operator. And if we subject, if we multiply through each of these equations by its respective dependent variable, in average, we get this bound for the time dependence, this sort of quasi-energy. It's not really energy, but quasi-energy quantity. It's positive definite. That's the important thing. What are the terms? the wish term. If it's going to amplify by wish, you have to have negative correlations of surface wind with free tropospheric entropy and or, sorry, saturation entropy or actual entropy. Um, we have the cloud radiation term, that's C. That has to be non-zero. And if it is, you have a positive definite contribution to the growth of energy. And uh, then you have these damping terms from surface fluxes and from this artificial wave radiation. And then you have what I call the weird moisture vertical velocity correlation, which I don't particularly understand. Uh, we can come back and talk about that. Now, we're first going to look at a, a there's, you know, the solutions of equatorial equations like this usually have a special mode, which we call V equals zero mode or the Kelvin mode. That is, there's no meridional velocity anywhere. We're going to look for um, normal modes uh, that are periodic in X. 
and with a complex growth rate sigma. And when you do that for this uh, set of equations, you get a cubic dispersion relationship for the complex growth rate. Usually you have one growing in one decaying mode, and a third root doesn't satisfy the boundary conditions that things have to be well behaved at y as y goes to infinity. Same as for the standard Matsuno modes, by the way. And we're also going to look at a, another version of the solutions where we apply Adam Sobel and Chris Bretherton's weak temperature gradient approximation, which means setting s equal to zero in the equations, and see how well that does. And in this v equals zero case, only a single mode survives when you do that. And that single mode has a growth rate sigma that looks like this. Let's just look at this for a minute. Remember, C is the cloud radiation feedback. This is the wave radiation emulator. And alpha is the wish term. So if you look at this, there's no growth without the cloud radiation feedback. It not only has to be there, but it has to be sufficiently large for growth to occur in the WTG limit. Um, since G is generally less than one, this is a non-dimensional G, um, it's actually, the growth rate's actually diminished by wishy, uh, by taking alpha to be larger. So the growth is impeded by the surface flux interaction. This is the phase speed, okay? That, by contrast, depends completely on wishy. Without wishy, this weak temperature gradient mode does not propagate. It grows, but it doesn't propagate. Okay, so that has a simple solution. Um, all right. So let's look at the full solutions w uh, together with the WT solutions for this V equals zero mode. It's just that mode. So the way I'm portraying it is this is non-dimensional frequency. This is non-dimensional zonal wave number. Positive means eastward. And the size of these dots is proportional to the growth rate. So you get this Kelvin wave spectrum and largely because of that wave radiation emulator, it's sort of favored toward the lower frequencies, lower wave numbers. And then you have these big blue dots down here, which don't fit on any of the standard Matsuno dispersion curves. And we call that the MJ mode. Frequency doesn't vary a lot. It does vary, doesn't vary a lot. The red dots are just the weak temperature gradient approximation to that. So the weak temperature Gradient approximation isn't too bad for those low frequency modes, but completely, you know, there's no Kelvin waves that survive that. That's because they're driven by buoyancy. And if you look at the eigenfunctions for a mode, for the MJO mode, they look kind of like Kelvin waves in this uh, rendition. Uh, so the colors are vertical velocity, S star are the contours. So high S star means it's hot, okay. So you can see a correlation between upward motion and temperature. And then the horizontal arrows are the surface or near surface winds. Okay, so that was interesting. That's all published. What's new? I always save that for the end of the talk. Not always, but this time. Let's look at, at the full solutions beyond the V equals zero mode. And this is a bit nasty. The dispersion relationship's eighth order polynomial. So you have to deal with that. Well, first thing we're going to do to test the solver, basically, is set all the damping and forcing terms to zero. We try to see if we reproduce the Matsuno modes. And yeah, we do. So the colors are the meridional mode number. You have a discrete spectrum in the meridional direction, as you do with the Matsuno modes. And the, um, it's just a wave number frequency decomposition. There's, these are all neutral modes. So the growth rate zero, but I had to visualize them. So I made the dots all the same size <clears throat> here. And so you see the equatorial Rossby waves, the Calvin waves, the mixed Rossby gravity wave, and so on. So that's, but now if you put in reasonable values of the parameters, it's very interesting what happens. You get weakly growing Calvin waves and uh, mixed Rossby waves and either even here some eastward propagating higher order internal waves. And then this whole spectrum of very low frequency modes, which don't fall on any Matsuno curve. These are so strongly forced by cloud radiation and their wish that it's hard to say anymore that they correspond to a Rossby wave or a Calvin wave. You don't really know what to call it. You're just forcing it too far away from the neutral modes to make sense of calling it one thing or another. Um, 
Now we'll just blow up that diagram to focus on the low frequencies. And so these different colors denote, so the V equals zero modes are denoted by N equals minus one here. This is the mixed velocity gravity mode, which doesn't have any correspondence at low frequency. And then these are the higher order modes. And one of the prominent ones is the N equals one, which in the Matsuno is strictly westward propagating, but here is also eastward propagating components to that. And um, so we're driving the solutions pretty far away from the classical Matsuno. So here is an eigenfunction for the N equals one eastward mode. No, it's not a Rossby wave. No, it's not a Kelvin wave. It's a mode of the system. That's all we can call it. But it's interesting. It, the temperature pattern has a sort of butterfly shape, right? Uh, strong correlations between temperature and vertical motion. You know it's uh, making kinetic energy. And if you look at the MJO itself, at observations, this is OLR, this is MSU derived temperature anomalies. It also has a sort of butterfly pattern. You don't see that butterfly pattern in any of the Matsudo modes, not even in any combinations of them that make any sense, all right? So what does this mean? It means that maybe we're making progress, but there's a lot more work to be done. So I know I've gone over time a bit, but... Um, I would say that not just from this talk, but from a lot of other evidence, points to the critical roles of cloud radiation interaction and surface flux wind interaction in the organization of convection in the tropics larger than squall lines. Squall lines and things of that scale are a different matter. It's an, or, it's an organization of convection that has not to, much to do with anything with the radiation or surface fluxes. The purely dynamical theories that we have thrown at the MGO problem for 40 years, okay, I would argue fail to explain in most cases uh, the observed mean, main observed properties of equatorial modes, even when you consider convective coupling, which of course you have to do. The recent research, and not just what I presented here, uh, has shown that MGO is, is quite probably an example of self-aggregation of convection in a rotating sphere driven by cloud radiation and surface enthalpy variations. Let me just conclude by saying, if I'm right about this, it means that if we are looking at full-up models, like climate models, and we're trying to get the variability right, it's not going to be so much about convection schemes, and it's not going to be so much about, probably not about numerical schemes. It's going to, you're going to have to get two things right, for sure. How clouds interact with radiation, and I would argue that's a tough problem, right? To do that quantitatively correctly. And uh, surface fluxes, right? Whose coupling to large scale flows in reality is somewhat complex. Uh, if I'm right, this is what we have to focus on. So what I'm trying to do is to get you to think about large scale variability very differently from what you've been taught in 101, all right? Latent heating is not a source of energy for anything going on, I would maintain, on scales bigger than squall lines in the tropics. And we should stop thinking about latent heating as external because we get into trouble that way. We exclude things that are impossible uh, if it's um, external, like negative correlations between temperature and, and latent heating. So that's the main thing I hope you take away from that and, and think about. Thank you. And sorry for going on too long, too. <laughs> so that was a very stimulating and interesting seminar. So I'm sure there's many questions. So I'll take one from Peter first. Um, Kerry, I was really intrigued by your emphasis on surface fluxes. Um, we know now that the ocean is horribly variable at the top of the water. Yeah. So I'm, the whole time I'm watching, I'm going, what does this do yeah. to your, uh, just if you could talk a little bit about yeah. that. No, I, that, that's a very important point. So everything I've talked about today has made the onsats of the ocean is entirely an interesting passive body of water with constant temperature. And we know that's not true, right? And there's a lot of literature that connect variability of the upper ocean with the MJO, among other things. And 
Um, I would only say in response to that is absolutely, you know, in my mind, the next step in taking this this kind of pathway forward in research is to look at ocean interactions. So yeah, I should have said that explicitly, but absolutely. So I have sort of a naive tropical question. You talked about the Wheeler and Colatus analysis. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't really realized how much of the variability you subtract out to get their plots. So what is all the rest of that stuff? Yeah. You know, that, that's a really good question. And it's embarrassing not to be able to tell you an answer to it. We can only speculate. Um, first of all, there's a lot of, mo in the real world, there's a lot of, even if you just started out with these pure modes, there's a lot of modulation because on a much grander scale, the atmosphere and the ocean underneath it are very inhomogeneous, right? So you've got continents, you have cold Eastern Pacific, cooler Eastern Atlantic. If all you, and you have, you know, trade winds that vary, uh, the Walker circulation, if all you did was to modulate these modes already, you'd be smearing out the, the wave energy. I doubt that explains the whole thing though. So there's a lot going on. Uh, that doesn't fit into this. And it's too easy to neglect that because human nature loves organization. And we pick out the organized things, even if they're 1% of the total, and we focus on that. So uh, my question has the same, my answer has the same flavor as my answer to Peter's question. <laughs> we should work on it. So, uh, Karen, because you know that I did some super parameterization work. I actually started that. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I argued through those denial experiments about MJO was actually the sensitivity of convection to the uh, free tropospheric humidity. Yes. And that kind of is, I mean, implicitly is there. Yeah. Definitely my initial simulation didn't have radiative uh, processes just homogeneous cooling, and it did produce something that looked like MJO. That's right. And of course, the humidity, you can argue that it kind of comes through surface fluxes and variability of that. Right. Uh, in this theory, can you somehow sneak in this uh, sensitivity of convection to, to the free tropospheric humidity? Or? It, it's actually there, and, and it's there in a sneaky way. Uh, well, it's not actually sneaky, it's a direct result of the boundary layer quasi equilibrium formulation. And if you remember that formulation of the mid troposphere is drier, for the same forcing, you get less convection. It's not going in through entrainment, though. It's going in through that process. So that's there. And if you t took that away, things would be very different. And you can get sort of you can get eastward populating modes by wish, for sure. But they're more like Kelvin waves in this model. Uh, you had multiple low frequency modes and you chose the wave number one eastward propagating one. Is that because it was the highest frequency or was there some reason you just chose that one to be uh, the dominant one? The main reason was I was out of time. Okay. But there <laughs> no, are, but the others might exist? Uh, no, the others exist and I could show you, I'd be happy to show you offline a whole. I mean, actually, I should say this, for anybody who wants it, I'm very much an enthusiastic uh, proponent of the um, adherent to the philosophy that we should make our codes open. These are very, very simple codes in the end. You can run on your laptop, and I've tried to make them very transparent. Anybody who wants to do that, you can look at all, all the eigenfunctions you want to, up to, I think, meridional uh, mode, mode number four in this, and see for yourself. I chose that one, though, because it, its temperature and vertical velocity pattern looked a lot like the MJO. So let's supposing it is kind of a linear rendition of that. Then what would we call the MGO? We wouldn't call it a Kelvin wave. It's certainly not that. But it has elements of a Kelvin wave. We wouldn't call it a Rossby wave. Nobody has, I don't think. But it does have elements of that. We can't, call, we can't pigeonhole them in this kind of. The forcing is too strong. That was the main point I wanted to illustrate. Yeah, hi, Kerry. Thanks for the fascinating talk. So I'm not a, a tropical guy, but a, a NOAA colleague of mine, Tom Hamill, remarked to me one time that the MJOs are trucking along just fine around the planet, and when they hit the maritimes in, in Southeast Asia, they just completely fall apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I don't know that anybody's explained it. Do you care to speculate on that? Well, I think, in a, from my understanding, it's a, rather the opposite of that. They reach their peak amplitude over the maritime continents, and they get east of that, they fall apart. Um, it depends on the metric. If you're looking at clouds, convection metrics, where low-level winds, you can't find a signal. If you look at the tropopause, the, the zonal wind anomalies, you can follow them all the way around the world, typically. Um, and that, I would say, is you know, partially a function of the fact that, again, we're in a, on the very largest scales, and the global scales, a very inhomogeneous atmosphere. It's cold eastern Pacific. You don't have a lot of convection there. It's not a moist, neutral atmosphere. So it doesn't happen there. But there's a signal that survives in the upper troposphere. And I have some ideas about that. We'll talk about that, if you like. I guess I have a question. Yeah. Much uh, research has been done on the effect of climate change on tropical cyclones, but would you care to speculate what the effects may be on these slow equatorial months? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Could you repeat the question? Yeah, I I can repeat it. So, what is the what's the effect? What's the effect of climate change on equatorial variability? I think it's a really excellent question. I'd love to know the answer. I think it would be easy to say how some of these parameters would change. I haven't looked at that. But I wouldn't want to put a lot of weight on that. Uh, there have been, you know, now that we have the numerical capability of doing, at least in idealized ways, whole global cloud permitting models, we're in a position to do that experiment. I don't, and we know that raising the surface temperature tends to uh, increase the lowest frequency variability in some of the simulations. But I haven't seen ones that on rotating planets that raise the temperature, but not sure they don't exist. Any more questions? If not, let's uh, thank our seminar speaker. Thanks. Thank you.